Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to The Frontline with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Resinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go into the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. As always, two things. We ask you to download the app, the Veritas app. You'll have access to all of our station's content. We are an EWTN affiliate, so you get EWTN programming and you get original programming like the front line with Joe and Joe, like Bishop Caggiano's show, Let's Be Frank. Um, and also, please follow Joe and I on social media, primarily in two places, the Frontline TV on YouTube, the Frontline TV on YouTube, and at with Joe and Joe, at with Joe and Joe on Twitter. Help us out, like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff. Uh, we really appreciate it. Today, we're going to be talking about Our Lady, and Joe and I love talking about Our Lady. And for that, we are very pleased and honored to be joined by Marlene Watkins. And Marlene has a new book out from Sophia Institute Press, Everyday Miracle of Lords, 20 Extraordinary Experiences Along the Way to the Grotto. And this is going to be a great conversation because, like I said, Joe and I love Our Lady, our show. We pray to Our Lady before, before we begin every show. Quick bio, though, for those of you who don't know Marlene Watkins, she's the founder of Our Lady of Lords Hospitality North America Volunteers, the first Lords Hospitality outside Europe and the first of the Americas. In 20 years as a volunteer, uh, Marlene has led over 200 pilgrimages to Lourdes for more than 6,000 pilgrims, including the seriously ill, the profoundly disabled, with medical, adult, university, and youth volunteers. She has guided Lourdes virtual pilgrimage experiences, TM, across North America and in Europe, Asia, South America, and Africa. In 2015, Marlene was named an Our Sunday Visitor Catholic of the Year. She's appeared on CBS, EWTN, PBS, BBC, and hosts the EWTN My Lord's Faith Journey miniseries. Now, Marlene is a wife, mother, grandmother, secular Franciscan, and member, I'm going to butcher this because it's in French, uh, member of the Hospitalité Notre Dame des Lords. Did I say that right, Marlene? Fabulous. All right. Well, Joe and <laughs> Joe, my wife, my wife and Joe's wife are sisters and they're Haitian. So they speak French and Creole. And I'll tell you from my experience, every time I try to pronounce anything in French, my wife laughs at me because I'm just an Italian guy from New Jersey. Uh, but Marlene, Marlene Watkins, welcome to the front line with Joe and Joe. Well, thank you for having us. It is the Hospital in Notre Dame de Lourdes, but it sounded very good the way that you said it. So it's the job. it was the the Italian American version, Marlene. Yes, there you go. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Joe, and we'll have a great conversation about Our Lady of Lords. As Joe said, Marlene, our custom is to pray to Our Lady before each and every show in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O oh most gracious Virgin Mary, never was it known that anyone who sought your help or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly into you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you we come, for you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your clemency hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'll be honest with you, Marlene. Um, we usually, you know, we get a lot of uh, requests from publishers. And when we saw this, we jumped at it. Um, and the more I looked into it, I'll be truthful with you. I love people who are passionate and you're clearly passionate about this. I think this is wonderful. Um, I really think it's, it's obvious you were called to do what you do. It's obvious. Um, and you've, you know, seen things and I can't wait to get into it. But before we get into the meat and potatoes of the book, just give everybody, in case people don't know, a little bit of background about the Miracle of Lourdes and about St. Bernadette, um, some Subaru. Some people may not know. Just briefly, and then we'll kind of jump right in. Well, so in 1858, um, the Mother of God came down from heaven and appeared on the side of the mountain in a little cave that we now call the Grotto in the Pyrenees Mountains. That's in, in southern France, southwest, near the border of Spain. 18 times there were these heavenly visits. And during these apparitions where Bernadette's the only one who can see the beautiful lady and Bernadette never calls her the mother of God or the blessed virgin. She always calls her Akiro, which means that one in her local dialect. Um, and it's not until 
as the as the apparitions progress, uh, Bernadette, you know, is told to drink and wash of the water. She digs in the ground and water bubbles up to this day. Thirty five thousand gallons a day of water um, come from the spring, which is now, of course, world renowned for the miracles, which is something we'll talk about. But during these apparitions, you know, the priest is wise. He wants to know who's this lady who wants a chapel, who wants people to come there in procession. Who is this woman asking for this that only Bernadette can see? And then on the 25th of March, which is the Feast of the Annunciation, for those who know that special day when um, Gabriel speaks to Mary in the, in the gospel, we hear about, you know, asking her to be the mother of our Lord. On that feast day, Bernadette feels a pull to go to the grotto. She goes there and she asks the, the beautiful lady three times and once more for her name because the priest wants to know. She says, our lady trembles and bows her head and then she looks up and says, I am, I'm she, I am the Immaculate Conception. Bernadette's never heard this name before. She runs to where the priest is after she leaves her blessed candle there in the grotto. And that's why you see candles burning because she always answers her questions and her prayers. And she runs and tells the priest, and he's stunned. You know, well, how can this girl who doesn't speak French, who can't read or write French or Latin, how can this poor girl possibly know the dogma that Mary's conceived without sin in the womb of her mother, St. Anne? He's so stunned that he throws her out and slams the gate behind her. They ask him later, why'd you do that? And he said, because I was going to start crying and I didn't want to be weeping in front of this little girl. Um, and the reason why is because then he knew without doubt, without question, who the lady has to be. It has to be the mother of Jesus Christ. It has to be the mother of God. She's the only one who has this favor, which is to be pure and perfect vessel to give birth to Christ, which makes sense that, you know, if you really, really think about that, she's without without the stain, she's preserved by her son and a, and a, and a beautiful grace. And so that affirms to the church and the world that this is the mother of God appearing there in the grotto. And of course, the miracles are happening during this time. And the bishop is so wise. And I love that prudence that we have in the church. He, he calls a doctor in to examine all the people that are claiming that miracles happen. And, you know, the medical director at the, the sanctuary today says, He's the most unusual kind of physician. Usually you go to the doctors when you're sick. People come to him and say, I'm cured. So his job is in reverse. He has to go prove that the person really had the disease they claim or not. He's not looking to, to qual call a miracle. That's a not a medical word. That's a holy word. That's up to the church. That's up to bishops. So what he's doing is he's looking to see is... Um, you know, is this something that can be proven? I mean, without doubt, without question, that means an unexplained cure. So they're going to measure it. They're going to, it has to have the documentation that's required. It's an exhaustive process. They're not all Catholic physicians on these teams. They're scientists and their, their aim, their mission is to say, can they explain it or not? There are 7,800 cases, dossiers on file of the probably millions of people who've experienced, you know, miracles at Lourdes, but who've gone through the process, 7,800 on file, and now there are 70 proclaimed by the Catholic Church. What that means is the bishop says this unexplained medical cure is from the hand of God. That's what a miracle is. So that process is something the church, you know, they, they, you might have heard about this. Anybody out there that when a saint is about to be canonized, that means publicly proclaimed as a proven friend of God by the church. There have to be three miracles attributed to the intercession of this person. You know, we say intercession. Well, you know, it's not Mary performing the miracles or it's not Bernadette performing the miracles. It's God, of course. It's a Christocentric shrine at Lourdes. It's Christ-centered, it, you know, through the intercession. You know, if we go in the Gospels to the wedding at Cana, you know, the first miracle our Lord performs because his mother asks. So she's a proven, effective intercessor. We know she's got the end there, right? It's her son. He never refuses her. So these miracles are profound. In the beginning, there's first a woman with a paralyzed um, arm and then there's a man who's blind in one eye they put this lord's water on this water that comes up out of the spring and they're cured so of course this has a huge impact this is we're talking you know 1858 so in the 19th century if you lived in a wheelchair if you were dying that you were homebound 
That's why in really old houses, they have the double doors. That's where your casket could go in and your casket could come out because you really stayed home. Well, at this time, the train tracks are being laid in Europe in 1866. By the time the miracles are approved and the bishop says, this really happened. The mother of God really came down from heaven. This is worthy of your belief and of your pilgrimage. Not required, but worthy of it. So people would get on the train. Their family would help get them on the train, send them to Lourdes, and then the whistle would blow and the good people of Lourdes would stop at the mill where they were working, they were stopped where, you know, in the field where they're farming, whatever it was, milking the cow, they would come to the train station and lift these people off the train and carry them down to the grotto. Incredible. And the bishop said, this is a beautiful grace given to you. Become an association in the church and the grace will flow beyond you. If you don't, it could die when you die. Mm. So they became the first Lord's Hospitality uh, back in 1883 and 1885. And there's two different kinds. One is the ones that are people that are there in France to help welcome the people who arrive from all these other places. The other one is the hospitality that brings the sick to Lord's. So there's one mother hospitality, Notre Dame de Lourdes, that you mentioned, and that's uh, those of us who there's about eight or 9,000 of us. We we commit, at, at, we make a holy commitment for the rest of our life after five years of serving for one or two weeks each year, we commit that when we're able, we'll come and serve. That means we'll help people in the water, we'll help people at the train station, the airport, at the processions, there's all these different services in the hospital bed facilities. Then there's the 240 or so that come from Paris, that come from Italy, that come from Spain, that come from Ireland. They cut, you know, every five days they have these planes flying throughout the season and they bring the sick from their diocese. So they had these in Europe, you know, for over a hundred years, they've had these beautiful public associations in the church. And it wasn't until we were founded that now there was one outside of Europe. And of course, we're, we're a country of all nations. I mean, if we look at us, you're Italian Americans, you know, you, you're married to Haitian Americans and, you know, all of us have an ancestry from somewhere. So uh, there are people who come with us from all over because there is no hospitality other than us that's outside of Europe. So we have people who come with us from South America, Central America, of course, Canada, we're North America, that includes Mexico, people who come from Asia to come with us because they want to be accompanied by um, competent medical professionals. And these, these people, lay people like you and me, so I say, you know, anybody who's taking care of someone in their life, you took care of your dad, your mom, you, you changed the baby's diapers, whatever it is that, you know, you babysit or you're in the caring profession of life, not as a professional, but it, we're all called to this love, then you can come and help someone. And then we have the medical volunteers and they make it possible. We bring, we bring people on ventilators. I, You know, oxygen concentrators, you see somebody pulling one, you know, yes, we bring that, of course. We're talking ventilators. We're talking infusion therapy, kidney dialysis. These are people, it's their dying wish or their life's wish to go to Lourdes. And these wonderful people pay their own way, give up their vacation time and go make this pilgrimage possible. And it's such a grace for everyone, but all the volunteers, they get a tax deduction. If you file a long form in the US, you can have a tax deduction for the expenses to do this, but that's not why they do it. And they all say the same thing. They receive more than they gave. It's just mm -hmm. an incredible, and you know, we have young people, teenagers that changes their lives, university students, people of all different ages. And then we have some people in the United States who don't leave the country. They're at the airport helping us get on the plane, get off the plane. So it involves everyone, the entire family of the church and those who are interested in the church or in this mission. And it's a beautiful ministry. Absolutely. Marlene Watkins is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. We're discussing her new book out from Sophia Institute Press. You all know what I'm about to say. Don't buy it anywhere else except the publisher. We need to support our Catholic publisher publishers as well as our Catholic authors. The book is Everyday Miracles of Lords, 20 Extraordinary Experiences Along the Way to the Grotto. I'm going to hand it over to Joe Marlene, but I wanted to just one quick comment. I mean, you spoke a lot. There is a lot to unpack. Two things, actually two things I want to say. Number one, it's one of the things I love more than anything about being Roman Catholic is that we, as Catholics, just our very existence challenges all the the the, the narratives out there about race because you just mentioned um, we our, our church goes, cuts across racial, ethnic lines, 
people from all over the world. My brother and my sisters are in Africa and Asia and South America. So I love that fact. Okay. The other thing I like is this more than anything. When you look at Our Lady of Guadalupe, when you look at um, Our Lady of Lords, okay, the Lord picks simple people, okay, um, sends Our Lady to speak to these very simple people, okay, and the bishop is skeptical, and I'm happy that the bishop is skeptical, especially because some people say, well, why is the bishop being so harsh? Because when you have people finding the Virgin Mary and a piece of toast, the bishop has to be harsh, okay, he has to be a little a little bit more, um, you know, uh, rigid in that way to say, well, hold it. Let's let's pump the brakes. I love that. And then what does Our Lady do? Go tell him my name's the Immaculate Conception. And boom, you're going to believe it because this young girl, she knows nothing about the Immaculate Conception. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Uh, but there's so much there to unpack. But I want to hand it over to Joe. As I said in the beginning, um, right after the prayer, Marlene, you're super passionate about this. Clearly, this place made a huge impact on you talk us through that talk us how you know through the impact how did it touch you personally like you know people go to lords i've never been but i know people who have they say it's great but that's it you keep going back something happened there what happened well first of all joe squared i love you guys that's all right um, yeah, I think it's uh, fabulous to answer this question. And I want to tell you, we can fix the fact that you've never been there. So that we'll put that on our list. I'll get here. there. I'll get there. <laughs> and I want to also say to the other Joe, thank you for pointing out the universal church is present in Lourdes. It's it's incredible because you you really see the universality of our faith when we're all together, 25,000 people in, in the underground basilica at mass from all over the world. So that is a beautiful blessing. But you're right. It had a profound impact. And I think I'm a typical, probably somewhat typical Catholic. I'm a housewife. I didn't go to Catholic schools. Um, I was cradled Catholic. I married to a man who's now a convert. So he, you know, had no knowledge of the, the Catholic Church, the Catholic faith. And when my best friend, and I don't know where you are in Jersey, but she was in Philly, just so, you know, off across the water from Jersey there. Um, she had her business card plucked out of a fishbowl at work and won two tickets anywhere in Europe. And she's a holy woman. So she picks Lords, calls me on the phone, says, hey, they're going to take my picture at this big pharmaceutical company that I won these tickets. And she said, where are we going? And I, of course, I was stunned. She picked Lourdes. And I said, I love that place with the three little kids. Well, that's Fatima. <laughs> it's the same lady. It's a different dress, different century, different country, different language, different message. But it's the same lady. You're speaking so our language. Those three little kids. You see, that's that's what I understand. <laughs> <Three little kids. laughs> so, you know, I I that's how much God has had to work on me that, you know, I and, and I have to say, as you pointed out, I've been there many times. I never go to the airport or get off the plane and say, oh, not again. Never, never, never. Every time I go, it's a unique experience. I learn something new. I'm, I'm privileged and excited to go. I'm an ordinary person with extraordinary privilege. So my best friend wins these tickets. And, um, you know, I think we're typical Catholics. We decide we're going to do like 23 uh, holy places in 21 days or something like 20, the opposite, you know, try to figure this all out. And my, my friend had read this book about incorruptible saints. So any of you out there that are familiar with this, Bernadette is the most beautiful incorrupt saint. What that means is she's not embalmed, she's not refrigerated, um, she's not oxygenated, but she's just never decayed. She looks stunningly beautiful. And people come from all over to see her. She's in Nevere, which is where she went in her religious life. Well, my friend read this book about the incorrupt saints and she picked these places that we would go around France and then she had in Italy and, you know, so these places we could go and, and see these incorrupt saints. So my husband, the convert, called it the Catholic dead body tour. He said nice. he's going to get shirts. <laughs> it's going to get shirts made for us that has the names of the cities like a rock concert on the back. So um, he can't believe we're going to do this. So, of course, she picks Bernadette and, and she has her best friend in heaven, which is Saint Therese of Lisieux, which everybody loves, of course, the little flower power. And, you know, I always really thought, oh, you know, I wish I had somebody like that in heaven with that kind of pull. But there's no Saint Marlene, says my husband. So I didn't have a patron saint. Right. So we go to Bernadette and I fall in love. I just 
I, her simplicity, her her beauty, her she's just uh, she's just a saint for me. I just love it, and a saint for everybody. And I think she's almost like a secret saint. Like a lot of people don't know her, other than she's incorrupt. School children go there today. Still, I was just there a few weeks ago and asked sister, wake her up, so we can ask a question. I mean, she's just stunningly beautiful. Marlene, so, fo follow up on follow up on that a little bit. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think it's an important yeah. point. You mentioned that you mentioned that Bernadette is simple. OK, yeah. um, if you look, you mentioned Fatima, three little children. Very simple. OK, Juan Diego, an illiterate. OK, um, yep. why does Our Lady do that? Well, I mean, I mean, a number you could speculate, I guess we could speculate. But what, what we want to know your view. Why does our why does our Lord send Our Lady to those people who don't have PhDs? They don't think too much about these things. They just accept because they're not childish. They're childlike in their trust. Talk about that a little bit, please. You know, they're not polluted by all kinds of, you know, uh, complications. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty direct. What I love about Bernadette, and it's in the book, is what a sister said to me in a bear. She said, um, you know, tell it like Bernadette did. She didn't add, because Bernadette embroidered beautifully because she had asthma and stomach trouble. Like she could hold the rope to skip rope, but she couldn't skip it herself. So she did things like embroider because you could sit and do that. And it's beautiful, her embroidery, very simple. And she said, you know, she never added anything to put a hole in the fabric of truth when you have to pull it back out. And she just, it was simple and beautiful. And that's exactly what she said, exactly what happened. So that's the beauty of her simplicity. That doesn't mean she isn't bright. That doesn't mean she's not smart. It just means she's, and look, you can even read in books that say, oh, the Bernadette, you know, they refer to her as, you know, um, you know, she's uneducated, she's not schooled, but they kind of refer to her as slow. No, that doesn't mean, you know, that's like saying meek and humble. People misunderstand that all the time. No, she's just really straightforward, pretty direct, pretty simple unfettered, doesn't complicate things. And in today's world, that's huge for us. We complicate everything. And, you know, when you strip it right down in the end, that simplicity is a blessing and a gift. And it's not easy because it has to be tandem with humility. Otherwise, it does become ignorant. But she's not ignorant. She's uneducated. She didn't go to school. So she can't read and write. But that's the beauty of when the, the mother of God says who she is, because that's not just her title. That's not just, you know, it's not the crown she wears. That's who she is. She is the Immaculate Conception, which is a dogma. It means we have to believe it as Catholics, but she is the Immaculate Conception. So when Bernadette says that, the beauty is she couldn't have read it. The, the priest knows. So in that simplicity that she has, and she goes a few days later and says to somebody, hey, what does that mean? And, you know, they did a study of, you know, like a, a pew search. You know, so keep in mind, these are people who go to mass, come out of church, they're outside, they take a quiz. They say, what's the Immaculate Conception? 75 to 95 percent of mass going Catholics randomly polled said it was the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So they thought that the the Immaculate Conception conceived. Jesus isn't conceived. He's God. It's He's incarnate. But that's what people thought. I can remember being a young adult calling my, I used to call it the hotline to the Vatican. I called my mother. Everything you know about the Catholic faith, you know, I called her. I said, Mom, I just wanted to be sure I was the only one in the break room at work who believed it was Mary conceived without sin. And everybody there, they're all very highly credentialed, with, you know, lots of, you know, real well papered doctors. They all really thought it was the incarnation. So that's a beautiful gift, a grace we get out of Lourdes is to really know the purity of the Immaculate Conception. And what's beautiful there is we're living in a very impure time. We're living in a world where there is such damage to people for impurity. So, you know, sins of impurity done to people or done by people, that can be restored in a grace, in a healing at Lourdes. And, you know, that's you said right at the beginning, and I'm taking you at your word, Joe and Joe, that I can, we can say anything that we think is significant here. There are people who are really wounded from abuse, including priestly abuse. And we hear a lot about it in the media. And of course it's horrific, absolutely. Everything we're reading about, you know, the church and how they get the safeguarding, the failures, the, the lawsuits, the money, the damage, the, the wreckage, all true. What we're not hearing is the healing. Mm -hmm. That is possible in Lourdes. And how do I know that? Because I've seen it.
because I've witnessed it. I'm a nobody, but I have seen it. And magnitude, it is profound. People who've been out of the church, understandably wounded and hurt, mm -hmm. isolated. They're older, they're dying. They want to go back to the sacraments. They can't find their way back home. But you know what? When I, I assume your dad's, but maybe, I don't know. But, you know, I, I, I'm i a mom, you know, where our, our sons are growing, we have grandchildren. But, you know, when the kids are little, they come, who do you, what do you do when you're hurt? Even in the foxholes, what do they say? That, what does the Marine want? His mother, you know, so, I, you know, you go to your mother when you're wounded. So a lot of people come to Lords that are suffering, they go to their mother and then she can bring them safely to her son. It's a beautiful healing that takes place there that's very random um, to people who have no understanding of the kind of healings that take place. But that's what this book is about, is that these kind of healings that don't get x-rayed and don't get measured, but that doesn't mean they didn't happen. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, if we go in the gospel, pick up your structure and walk to the paralytic or your sins are forgiven, which is greater. So, right. So the man, the paralytic in the gospels, he could go to the, he could qualify for the medical bureau. He could, he could go there and show that he was paralyzed. He's healed. He could become an unexplained cure. However, your sins are forgiven. Can't x-ray that. But even the gospel says, which is greater. So that means these other incredible healings in, you know, conversions and all these things that are taking place, they are they're, they're, they can be greater. They can be great. And they are. Yeah. So I think that tying it to the Immaculate Conception is really, at this time, makes sense to me. That And at first I was saying, why are all these people coming that have this wound? Well, that's because this is where they can find healing. I think, Marlene, we're going to take a break in a minute. Um, a quick comment. And for those of you just joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, uh, we're speaking with Marlene Watkins. We are discussing everyday miracles of Lord's 20 extraordinary experiences along the way to the grotto. So we're going to take a break. Two things. Uh, yes, I would say that it's wonderful when someone has physical needs, physical healing. But even more importantly, see a person who's physically injured and wants healing can be spiritually outstanding, you know, mm -hmm. like really doing very well in that regard. It's those who you don't know who are really, like you mentioned, wounded. I would say two things to any of those people, because Joe and I have in, in, we, I, we're, we're privileged enough to interview James Grind on our show a couple of years ago. He was one of McCarrick's earliest victims, right? He He's the churchman. He's in the church. OK, he gets angry and things like that. He's in the church. There is healing. Um, and, and I would encourage that. The other thing I would comment, Marlene, and I'll ask for your comment when we come back is Jesus asked the lame man, would you be made well? And I think that that's a comment on our culture. I think it's those who are, who don't think they're injured, don't think they're wounded. They think they got it all tidied up. Okay. A lot of pride going on. You mentioned humility earlier. Okay. A lot of pride going on out there. You know, if people would avail themselves sometimes of something like going to Lords, going to the grotto, their eyes might be opened a bit. I that, That's just my own little my own little comment, Marlene Watkins. Stick around with us here. You're at the front line with Joe and Joe. Marlene Watkins, you're on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. So uh, we have another great segment talking about Lords with Marlene Watkins. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo, Joe Racinello. We are way in the breach uh, on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network with Marlene Watkins. We're discussing her new book, Out from Sophia Press, Everyday Miracles of Lords, 20 Extraordinary Experiences Along the Way to the Grotto. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Joe Racinello. Marlene, talk about some of those uh, stories that you note know in the book. I'm sure they're amazing, and I'm sure our listeners would want to know about them as well. Thank you for that, because each of these stories is you know as you're going to point out is that each of them is uniquely different and they're all not related so you can pick up the book read one chapter set it down and then and wait and go back because each of them is unique so somebody who's really busy can't pick up a whole book and read it all the way through read it by chapter by chapter because each one of them is so different and i'm thinking of somebody right now because they're from jersey so i being it um italian americans do you know the word shiv you know you yeah. shiv 
Yeah, you know, yeah. indeed. Well, I, I, you know, it's not a word that everybody knows. It, it's actually came out of, um, the, you know, they call it East East Philly over there down in, in Jersey across the water and uh, over the bridge from Philadelphia. And it's a word that means like, you're, you're like, you know, ooh, you, you, you're disgusting. You know, disgusting. Yeah. yeah. You know, you just you know, like make sure you ski, you ski but you just don't want like, to give you the, the ick, you know, when you see it. So there was this beautiful, beautiful, when I say beautiful, I mean, she could have, she could have been on television. She's that kind of beautiful Italian American girl, but she's a girl of science. She's brilliant. And she winds up taking a, you know, a career in science. And then she winds up, everybody would want to be her. It's in the book. And you see her picture. She's everybody's picture in each chapter. They're real pictures in the book. They're real people. Um, until she gets leukemia, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's not so desirable. She's supposed to be on the beach, you know, on the Jersey Shore. Instead, she's getting, you know, bone marrow transplants. So she comes to Lord. She's dying. She knows the risks of an immune suppression. She does get platelets in France. We prearrange all of that. Um, and it's her dying wish to go there. And so her parents, God bless them, bring her. And a friend of hers from high school becomes a priest. And we go there and, you know, she thinks this is all lovely. But in the end, what happens is we're, we're you know, we're going to board the plane at JFK in New York. And she refuses to get in a wheelchair. And I think, well, you know, people are reluctant to get in because they're afraid they'll never get out again. That's not it. She gives people in wheelchairs. They give her like the, the you know, she, she thinks maybe your mother thinks possibly when they were young and they went to a nursing home and kind of, you know, upset her. So, or something. So, but she never tells anybody. She's kind, she's gracious, she's lovely to people. You'd never know it. And then she goes to Lourdes and she, she has no choice. She's so weak. She has to be in a wheelchair. Now she's eye to eye with all of these people and she falls in love. And as she describes it to me, her heart rips open and expands to just, it's so profound. And even when she gets her energy and strength and is able to stand again, she just she just is so moved by these people that before made her very uncomfortable. So she describes it. I saw that's the last obstacle to total love. That's the story of the famous, you know, half Italian, half French, you know, St. Francis of Assisi. You know, he sees the leper and back then they ring the bell and, and you know, the biblical leper, they're terrified of this. There's no cure for that until the 1940s. We're talking 2000 years with no cure. And they'd have to ring a bell if you wouldn't go near him. And Francis, as much as he loves God, he has this huge conversion. He's still terrified. And all of a sudden he jumps off his horse. He has this grace. He goes and he hugs. He embraces this man with leprosy, Hansen's disease. And as soon as he does, the man disappears and he knows it was Jesus Christ. That was Francis's last obstacle to total love. And that's what explodes his heart open. And that's what happens to this young girl, Andrea. So Andrea goes back home, writes this beautiful, short, simple, beautiful letter to her family and friends and says, I wish everybody who needed to go to Lourdes could go. She dies a few weeks later. And all the people send money to Lord's volunteers, little Lord's volunteers, and says, you know, this is for Andrea's wish for a bit. Well, there was no Andrea's wish. Well, so we all this money came in, $26,000, and her parents came up to Syracuse, New York, from Jersey. And they we, we met together and talked about what should we do with this money. And ultimately, in the end, we decide anybody who needed to go to Lord's, it's written in her letter, it's how she lived it, that's what we'll do. So they wanted to preserve some of it and just send one person a year. But we said, well, we can't tell anybody no. So the first year, all $26,000 goes exactly. And then the next year, at the end of the year, I, I call them up and I say, okay, this is how many people went this year. And they were sobbing on the phone. They thought it was done. No, $63,000 came in unsolicited for Andrea's wish. And uh, just a few years ago, we were at the Vatican reporting in our annual report, and um, uh, we had never added up over the years how much it was. And in about 15 years, it was $1.3 million sending people to Lourdes. And what's beautiful about Andrea and her wish was she didn't quantify it as you had to have cancer like her or you had to be paralyzed. She said, anyone who needs to go. So people have gone who are, are veterans with PTSD, um, you know, people who've been abused that we've mentioned earlier, people who are sick and dying, terminally ill, people who are depressed and suffering. Everyone who needs to go gets to go through Andrea's wish. So that's a chapter in the book because the beauty of her story isn't just that Andrea's wish is founded. That's actually a different story. The story of Andrea is that 
she finds this last obstacle to total love three weeks before she dies. She doesn't even know she has this. It's not something she's actively thinking about. And all of us have those kinds of, you know, underneath the, you know, underneath us, there's some kind of grudge. There's something we're holding. It's we're so used to it. It's like a scar on us. We just don't even notice anymore. So there's those kinds of stories, you know, people who there's another one in the book, you know, a young woman, she's abused as a seven years old. And unbelievably, she never tells her parents. This girl suffers thinking she's damaged. She's no good. Um, you know, all these things building up in her mind until she, she goes away to college and she finally gets some help for this. But where it came from is she came to Lourdes and volunteered. And when she was in the bath, she said her purity and her dignity was restored. That they can be taken from you. They can be robbed physically. But there's a spiritual essence of dignity and purity that those in a grace can come back and be given back to us. So really it changed her whole life. It changed you know everything in her life. So those kinds of miracles are in there. Again, you can't x-ray that. There are two stories in the book that they did go to the medical bureau. And for you know two different reasons, they don't uh, don't make it all the way through. But that doesn't mean that something didn't happen to them. And I, you know, I just really over the years we had a, a priest and we have a spiritual director who said, "You got to write these things down. You got to this." I mean, oh, I'm just an ordinary person with the extraordinary opportunity to witness these things. I know every person in this book. There are real pictures in there, and every person signed to say. This is my story. It really happened. It is accurate. Now, a few of the people in the book have since died. Those people, we went to people who knew them or were with them and asked them to read it to make sure it was accurate. But they're all, you know, they're so different. Unless we went through every single chapter, you can't possibly know the wonderful graces that are waiting there. I mean, it's just incredible. And well, not that's, that's why that, Marlene, that's why people have to go out and buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> they, have to, they have to actually go out and buy it. We don't want to give away the whole book here. The book is everyday miracles of Lords, 20 extraordinary experiences along the way to the grotto that's available at Sophia press. The author is with us today, Marlene Watkins. I think those are beautiful stories and they're, they're you know, I know the skeptics out there would say, well, those are fairy tales. Well, actually, no, and that's all I got to say about that. Joe Resinello. Marlene, what are the three P's of the gospel message of Lords and well, how they relate to our life today? Thanks for asking that, too, because, um, again, it's simple. It's prayer. You know, Our Lady asked Bernadette to pray for sinners. So we go to Lords, we're Bernadette. So all of us, that's our mission when we leave, is to pray for sinners. And isn't that what we need right now? We need to be praying for those who don't know God, those who've turned away from God. That's our, our job and our mission is to pray for sinners. And that becomes Bernadette's vocation as a religious sister. So prayer, that's the first thing. Bernadette and Our Lady, the first thing they do when Bernadette meets Our Lady in the grotto, she says she's the most beautiful lady. They make the sign of the cross. It's so simple, Joe and Joe, with all of her heart. She says from that moment forward, she never made the sign of the cross like she used to. All of us, we're in the good habit. We make the sign of the cross. Sometimes it looks like eternity. I mean, are we really, are we really covering ourselves with the blessed Trinity? You know, Bernadette, with all of her heart, would call on the three persons in one God. Make the sign of the cross thoughtfully. It was ample. It was a large sign of the cross, slowly. So it's prayer and then penance. Our Lady asked Bernadette, penance, penance, penance. Pray for sinners. Now, all of us, nobody, notice Bernadette doesn't have to run out and go find a penance. None of us, anybody listening here, we don't have to go find something. We've already got it. We might be married to it. We might have given birth to it. You know, we might be working with it. In school, it could be the, you know, the kid in the next chair. All of us have something that we can offer. Now, some things we shouldn't offer, we should correct, but something that we can offer up, something we'd rather have be a different way. And we can say, you know, I am going to offer this up for a sinner, somebody you know, somebody you don't know, somebody you love, somebody you don't love. It can be anybody that we're praying for. So it's prayer, penance, and then procession. And, you know, we have a tendency to think of it like a parade. A parade is look at me and what we've done. A procession is we are proceeding somewhere. None of us is getting out of this lifetime alive. Not a one of us. Every one of us listening right now, we're all not, we're all going to die. So where are we going and how are we getting there? There's two processions each day at Lourdes. One is a Eucharistic procession. 
I had no idea what that is. I'd never seen a Eucharistic procession before. And I think I'm a typical Catholic. I just never saw one. So it's where our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, in the monstrance, under the canopy with the poles, the trumpets are blaring. Here comes our Lord, this beautiful procession. And it's the only Eucharistic procession that we know of where the sick come first. They're the VIPs. They're the really important people there, and those serving them. So, you know, the, the sick are there. It's just a tremendous. And then there's adoration and the beautiful Eucharistic blessing. The second procession of the day is at nine o'clock at night. Everybody gets a candle. None of them are lit. And then we all come together to pray the rosary in our own language. Again, the universal church. We light up Christ's candles off each other. And then we pray the rosary together and all the different languages. You know, a priest from Mayo, or a doctor from Mayo Clinic said to me, this is the real miracle of Tuesday night, 25,000 people from all over the world, people who fought in wars against each other are now here praying together. So it's, you know, penance, it, prayer, procession, you know, those, those are their ways. And there's a, there's a chapter in the book, a woman who's allergic to bee stings and doesn't know it. She's stung right in the throat. She she doesn't know what's wrong with her. She goes in the house. She looks at a show on EWTN. She knows what time it is because she'd usually be leaving to go to mass. The next thing you know, she's on the floor and she's praying the rosary. And ultimately, her husband calls an ambulance. But the time it took her to pray the rosary, she should have been dead in minutes. It took her four hours or more to pray one whole rosary. And during that time, it was like she was preserved. But what happens is when they get her, she's unresponsive. She's blue. She's blue. You know, in the ambulance, uh, they even they said to her husband, oh, don't, you know, just take your time, go to the hospital, because they don't think she's going to make it. When the ambulance crew goes in the house and her husband's driving from work, she goes into a coma for three days. In this coma, the whole time, she's at the Eucharistic procession in Lourdes because she's she goes and volunteers there. And she when she gets, you know, wakes up, she's very, very groggy, her throat from, you know, they've run down or they've intubated her and everything. She's she's trying to tell me, you know, there's that's it. That's where that's how you go to heaven. You just follow Jesus and the Holy Eucharist. You just follow that procession. She describes what she saw and the procession. She's up above at the vantage point. She goes, you follow that. And that's how you get to heaven. The Holy Eucharist and this procession at Lourdes. She goes back into a coma. And when she wakes up, she still remembers that the, you know, in the first coma having, it was so profound to her. Just So she makes rosary beads and, and you know, has these prayer groups come to her house and pray thousands of rosaries um, and Thanksgiving that Our Lady preserved her. So she really, she says, I, I really feel she interceded for me. She said, anybody who's worried, go, pray, pray the rosary because she's really, you know, like Bernadette and Our Lady in the Grotto. But that's another one that's, I mean, her story is really amazing. It's pretty incredible. Her name is Cora. Marlene Watkins is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Let me ask you this. You mentioned prayer. Um, so St. Bernadette had a simple prayer um, that uh, that teaches the way to get into heaven. So what what is that all about? What's that simple prayer? Well, Bernadette's a, the daughter of a miller. So part of Bernadette's poverty is that her um, her her parents wind up losing the, the mill. They wind up they wind up homeless. They wind up living in a jail. So, you know, anybody who has a, anybody listening who has a loved one in jail, Bernadette's a great saint to, for, for prisoners because she lived in a jail and it was, you know, and now it's a holy place because a holy girl lived in there. That jail is now a holy place. People come from all over the world to go and pray in it. So uh, we can make a place holy, the grotto, not a nice place. And then the mother of God appears there and it becomes a holy place. Ask the mother of God, go be with those who, you know, fallen like the grotto or in, in the jail. So Bernadette later in her life says love without measure. That's one of her, you know, her beautiful expressions. Well, you know, if her parents had measured better, they wouldn't have lost the mill. They wouldn't have lost their business. They wouldn't have lost their, their place to live. They wouldn't have lost everything. Um, and, but for her, she knows what it means when, you know, measurement is critical. It means profit or loss. It means homelessness or not, you know, so love without measure is a beautiful prayer. Prayer, And of course the rosary, but are, are you referring to a different prayer of hers? No, I, 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 I was no, in the, the book. Impression. It says, uh, what's it called? That she had a simple prayer that you could pray that get you into heaven. This, well, the sign of the cross is one of them. She says, if we pray that one prayer well, if we pray the sign of the cross well, we can go to heaven. There we go. It's the blessed trinity. That's okay. I didn't know which part of the book you're referring to. Sorry. Yeah. So she says that later in her life as a religious sister, that's simple. She keeps it simple. I like simple. I like simple, Marlene. Yeah. 
Simple, yeah. simple works for us. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, you know, call on the blessed Trinity. And if we think about that, it is, it's like a shield over. She says, you know, pray that prayer well. And, you know, we are in Catholic schools sharing the message of Lords. We're, you know, we're under a, a mango tree in Africa. We're all, we're communist China, all over the places we've been. And it's amazing how many Catholics and, and uh, me amongst myself before I went to the Lords and still now I still have to remind myself that we, we're just, we're kind of sloppy because it becomes habitual. And, you know, hey, habit's a good thing, virtue's better. But, you know, if we can pray that prayer well, you know, calling on the three persons, really think about it, that's that's the heart of our faith is the, you know, the blessed mm -hmm. trinity and the Holy Mar Eucharist. Marlene, it's funny. I don't believe in coincidence. I, I read the uh, Magnificat every day and they feature two saints a day. St. Bernadette was featured this morning. My hand up. Oh, I could go through the oldest of nine kids. Father was a, success, a successful miller, lost it at all. The, I swear, I read that this morning. My hand up. And it, and I wasn't even thinking about this interview yet. So it's just that that kind of makes me get goosebumps a little bit. It's kind of crazy. You're a well, special wait, wait, person. What, what makes me get goosebumps, I want to just make a quick comment on simplicity, okay? And I'm just going to throw this in there as an Italian-American, as an example of those who like to complicate things. You don't have to complicate a pizza by putting pineapple and ham on it. Just stick with the mozzarella and you'll be absolutely fine. There you go. There's something to be said for simplicity, okay? So I just wanted to throw that in there. Some people like to complicate things way too much. Now, now listen, you're, you're a time you're, to... Go no, ahead, I was going to say, ahead. she's a very... You're a special person, um, honestly, because the zeal for this, to be honest, you're similar in, in many respects to Bernadette. God called you. You can God. tell the zeal that you have for I this. You're, you're normal. You're a normal show. person. I am I'm just an ordinary person with an extraordinary. I mean, that's why even like they say this book, I don't have a college degree. I mean, I'm not a writer. I'm not trained. I was just a witness to these. And I just wanted to honor them and do these, these beautiful graces justice. But I have to tell you in the beginning of Lord's volunteers, how they knew that we should become a public association of the Christian faithful and the Catholic church governance by a bishop, how they said it to me is because we know you, we know you could not possibly do this. You're just not capable. My my oldest sons, when I brought them to Lourdes the, the first time years ago, they turned around and they go, Mom, these people know you can't even find your car keys in your pocketbook. You don't you don't can't find your car in a parking lot. I said, Well, I looked down and I said, Yeah, but I didn't drive them here. You know, I mean, they were I like, How can you, Yeah, how could you do this, Mom? You just, you know, but for God gave me a grace, but it was my inability that was the evidence, my inability, incapability, inexperience. That's when they said, this has got to be God, because there's no way you could, you could, you couldn't pull this together. And I couldn't, I couldn't it just, but amazing people have come forward to make this all possible. I, I mean, if you think about bringing such sick people to Lourdes, I mean, that takes, uh, you know, an army of our ladies, you know, we say we love it when our lady introduces us to her friends. And in this book, it's over and over again, just when something's needed. That's when somebody presents themselves. We'll have all these, you know, these parents calling us crying. Their children are dying. And we'll stand there in the midst of the phones. And I say, we need to say a prayer for a pediatrician. I'm not kidding you. Both shows. Phone rings, pick it up. Hi, I'm a pediatrician. I'm thinking about going to Lourdes. These things really happen. So in this book, though, they're, they're healings that are for people like every one of us. There's, I don't think there's anybody that could read this book that couldn't relate to at least one chapter or one person and their brokenness and their woundedness and their suffering, grieving parents, suicide, addiction, uh, all of these things. It's just been, it's so profound. It's just, I, all I can say is, you know, it, you, you know, if you, and I know we're supposed to be out there selling the book, you're right. We have to support our Catholic publishers, but borrow the book. <laughs> Don't get, well, I hope somebody finds this in a laundromat, dog-eared, and, and the day that they need to read it the most. Yeah, it's, find it's it on a the, park bench somewhere. Who cares? Just read it. <laughs> just, it. just, just, just read the book. <laughs> and you know, the person I'm staying with here in, outside Belfast, Ireland right now, is she said to me, you know, I think you should stick a label in this book and you should leave one in every city you go to. And to and put something in there that if you find this book, read a chapter and then leave it for someone else to find it. And that's, I that's we're a beautiful think thing. about doing something like that because you know, just when you need it most, that's when you need to know there's a grace, it's it's there for you. And I also want to point out, not everybody gets on a plane and goes to France. 
And you'll read, you know, like the woman that it's her husband takes the shotgun and puts it right to her gut and shoots her. You know, the, the doctor tells her, you know, later, you know, in the movies and when they get, you know, the shotgun and he says, and they all, oh, that's dramatic. They bleed to death. He goes, that's what happens. But she actually survives, but she's got a gaping hole in her 11 years, 33 surgeries, three skin grafts. Nothing will close that hole. It's always infected. She gets a little bottle of Lord's water from anybody that's listening to you www.lordsvolunteers.org will send you water. You don't have to send any money. God provides. Some people send money. Some people don't. It always evens out. It pays for it, itself to ship that water over. We'll send you the Lord's water. She's a scientist. She says, I know this is unsterilized water. I shouldn't put this in an open hole. I'm going to be on IV tomorrow for an infection. She is an act of faith. She dumps it in. She says, I'll go to the hospital in the morning. Wakes up and it was healed. Closed. After 11 years, 33 surgeries, it just amazed. I mean, so she didn't go to Lourdes. The water was sent to her. So, you know, we don't, you know, God is awesome. He's not bound and restricted by the things we place on him. He doesn't, you know, he he can do whatever that's best for us. And I think Absolutely. And most people, they say the same thing. I didn't get necessarily always what I wanted, but I got what I needed. You know, and I don't know about any of you or any of your listeners, but I was in line at the best. I'm going... Like Santa Claus, Jesus, I need this. God, I need that. My husband needs, I, oh, I know what my husband needs more than he does. Yeah, I got this list, my kids. And you make this Santa Claus list. And the reality is, it's the grace we're in greatest need of. We probably have no idea what it is. So, um, you know, ask for the Lord's water. Um, if you need to go to Lord's, let us know. Just, um, you know, read the book if you can, borrow it. Just um, and know that these miracles that took place 2000 years ago in the gospel, that wasn't the dead end of it, the story. This is this is 2000 years later. You go to Lord's. It's the gospels happening right now. And if you think, oh, I'm not so sure those are parables, those are stories. They're 2000 years ago. I don't know. Listen, you can be the next great St. Thomas. You just need to put your hands and rest them on the wound of someone today. So go to the go to the Lord's Medical Bureau. Look at these. I mean, these incredible X-rays. Victoria McKelly, an Italian guy. I mean, it, the, the cancer ate right through his bones. We have his X-rays, and when we do the virtual pilgrimage, we bring it to your parish. Your while we're in your parish, we're going to go to your school and we're going to go to the prison. You bring us to your parish, and those prisoners get to hear in your local, you know, prison. And we bring the message of voice. We have his x-rays. And it, it's incredible. The cancer ate right through the bones, disconnected his leg from his hip. He goes in the water. No chemotherapy, no radiation. Goes in the water. They lift him up. It, it completely grew back all of his bones. Mar we Marlene, we, we, we only have a few minutes left. We want to get to one more topic, if that's okay. okay. So Joe and cool. I are of the opinion, because we do a lot of politics and culture on our social media show, all right? Lot to talk about, especially what's going on in America. We're we firmly believe that uh, our Lord might have a nice visit in store for America from Our Lady, the same way she did at Lords Fatima, um, Guadalupe. Uh, but in the meantime, you're on the road. You got yourself an RV, and you're bringing. I love this. You're bringing Lords out there in about three minutes. Talk about that. Okay, so we call this the Lords Mobile, and it's uh, so it's a little RV. 30 feet sounds like it's big, but when we're next to all the other rigs, we're the smallest RV that, that you know, that you can get out there in a class day. So we, and the, the belly of it's usually filled with Lord's water. Now it'll be filled with, with books. So we want to go to the 20 places of these 20 people in the book and have them speak. So I was just in, um, in England and Scotland, my husband and I, with a woman in the book who had a gaping hole in her from a forced abortion when she was 15. Her mother ripped her hair out of her head, pulling her into the, the abortion to get the abortion when she was 15. And she always had this hole in her. And, and she she was baptized, became a Catholic, went to counseling. She said the hole was still there. She said, I, I knew I was forgiven, but she said, I just, the full, I wasn't healed. Goes to the Lord, fills the hole. So she was just with us in, in England and Scotland speaking. And now we're here in Ireland. And of course we were in France first because the book is in French and English. It's being translated right now in Spanish. When we come back to the United States, we're going to these 20 places. Um, it's going to take us about 18 months because there's other people we'll weave to in between and to share these graces and these stories because they're just incredible um, witnesses of the gospel today with real people. You can see their pictures, you can meet them, and you can talk to them.
It's, it's really incredible. And, you know, these people, by the way, they didn't want to be in a book. But, you know, when I called it, these are very private, personal stories. And one young woman, really courageous, the young woman I spoke about earlier that was, you know, uh, sexually abused by a neighbor when she was seven um, and, and, and doesn't tell her parents and suffers from it. I wrote a very sanitized version of her chapter. She called me up and she said, you write it all or don't, not at all. She, she said, I want people to know how powerful this grace of healing is. So it's all in there. So these people who didn't plan on being in a book were willing to come forward because they believe the grace is too great to hide. And they believe that the um, the grace has to be shared for somebody else who might be suffering. So the Lord's mobile, my husband is going to drive me. I'm always in the passenger side screaming, your other left. You know, so. <laughs> we love you, Marlene. You're our people. So the book uh, that we've been discussing here for the last hour or so, if you're just joining us here at the Veritas Catholic Radio Network on the front line with Joe and Joe, is out from Sophia Press, Everyday Miracles of Lords, 20 Extraordinary Experiences, all the way to the Grotto. Marlene, in about a minute, sum it all up. What do you want to impart to our audience in, uh, with some last words? We have a loving God, and um, he's still intervening in our lives. And if we, like you said earlier, if we welcome him, if we ask him, if we ask. And, um, you know, to go and to help others is often a grace where we find a healing for ourselves. But these miracles are happening all the time. The mother of God's watching over us, and she's um, the perfect mother. As she was to her son, she is to all of us. So um, I hope everybody finds this grace and knows that miracles really happen and they're happening all the time. Thank you for that, Marlene. And where could folks buy the book and where could they learn more about uh, your pilgrimages and all that? Okay, www.lords, L-O-U-R-D-E-S, volunteers. Dot org and on there it tells you like if you're in Europe how you can get the book if you're in the United States how you can get it Canada all, you know the different ways you can get the book and then um, if you want to come and volunteer or help or if you're sick or you know someone that needs to go you can just go to the website and we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Marlene Watkins, thank you for this beautiful conversation. It, it really, really was a pleasure. We love talking about Our Lady, but w we love when we have lively guests also. And you are definitely a spark plug. So, so we love you and you're welcome back at the front line anytime. Thank you so much, Marlene. Thank you so much. We'll be praying for you. Thank you. We'll do the same. And thank you out there for joining us on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith in the New York City metropolitan area. Download the app, share it with your friends, and please follow Joe and I on social media, primarily at the Frontline TV, the Frontline TV on YouTube, and at with Joe and Joe, at with Joe and Joe on Twitter. Like, subscribe, share, help us out, do all that fun stuff. And remember until the next time that our conversation is your conversation and that conversation is going on everywhere. We'll talk to you soon.